Thanks, Meg. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. I think it's good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for everybody. Uh, we're really <clears throat> looking forward to sharing some tips and tools that um, the panelists have learned in the time that they've been in this Young Leaders Program. And we're going to cover a lot of different topics. This program took place over four months, and we had 23 uh, participants from Ally Law member firms from, I think, like 16 or 17 different countries. So it was a really rich program with very uh, good participation. And we're going to be covering a lot of different areas today. We're going to be covering uh, some aspects of business development. Like, do you pitch yourself? What is a pitch? How do you introduce yourself at a networking event? How to have difficult conversations? What, what it means to use neuroscience to build trust and confidence in the people that you're building connections with? How to have a habit around business development? And uh, identifying different niches. Like, how do I find that niche and how do I market to it? So we're gonna be speaking to the panelists about these different topics. And I do encourage you, if you have any questions, to throw them in, but hopefully you'll walk away with some great ideas and tips for yourself that you can then put into practice. Today on our panel, I'm really, uh, I'm so overjoyed to be able to share um, these panelists with you. Michael Tom is an associate at Ally Laws, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania member firm Obermeyer, and he represents clients in a wide variety of banking, construction, and real estate matters. Ada Danella is a member of Ally Laws, Seattle, Washington member firm Summit Law Group, and she concentrates her corporate law practice on business formations and governance mergers and acquisitions, financing, and SEC reporting and compliance. Ursha Maganin is a principal in Ally Law's Chicago, Illinois member firm, Much. She represents business owners, executives, and entrepreneurs on complex corporate transactions, restructurings, and banking and finance matters. And Sumana Murthy is an associate in the real estate practice of Ally Law's New York member firm, Philip Neiser. She focuses her practice on the sale and acquisition of commercial properties and in real estate financing. So welcome to our panelists and let's get this show on the road. So the first question I wanted to ask to the panel was, um, you've learned a lot of business development skills in the time that you've been in the program and hopefully you're more comfortable with it now than you were before. Um, what do you think about this whole idea of ditching the pitch. I, I talked a lot in the in the program around, you know, we're not pitching, we're not salesy salespeople. We're really introducing ourselves to networking events. So let's talk about how you're doing that now and what your thoughts are around that that topic. So maybe Ursha, you want to start? Sure. Sure. You know, one of the things that we lawyers do when we start our career is we focus on legal research, legal writing and, and solving problems. But nobody tells you in law school that, you know, 10 years down the road, you will start, have to start developing your business and start selling your services. So you all of a sudden are realizing, oh, oh, my God, I got to do this. And I have to become an entrepreneur starting selling. And a lot of attorneys are uncomfortable and they're hesitant to start asking for business. So Stephanie was really good about telling us, you know, forget this old idea about, you know, elevator speech, um, do the pitch. Nobody really does business in the elevator anyway, <laughs> so it doesn't work. Uh, what you should do is try to connect with people in a natural and spontaneous way, something that's going to be authentic. Introduce yourself, you know, in a way that leads to another com to, to a conversation rather than, you know, just saying, for example, I say, oh, I'm an M&A attorney. Well, what is the other person going to say? It's not really a conversation starter. Um, so, you know, if I say, for example, that I help families and private equity owners buy and sell mid-sized businesses, then the person can ask a question or they can give me a little bit more detail about what they do so I can envision. And then people relate to it that and you find common interests. You can relate on a, you know, much broader uh, at a much deeper level. And Stephanie throws in there neuroscience that she's much better explaining than I would be. But when you are in that state of developing a connection, you know, it, it's much more um, helpful, not to mention it's more enjoyable. And this is how you really ditch the pitch, forget about being salesy and pushy, but try to connect with people. And then, you know, the, the business comes in the, you know, in, in the long run. So just focus on that. 
Yeah, that's really, really well said. I did talk a lot about neuroscience in the program and this whole idea of the elevator pitch. Like I really don't like it because I've never, I've been in sales for, I don't know, 25 years. I, I've never been in an elevator where I've pitched somebody something ever. And if somebody pitched me in an elevator, I'd probably, you know, <laughs> run out, I'd haul, haul out. So the idea is that, you know, when you're going to networking events, you want to start a conversation and you want to be casual and you want to build connection. You're not pushing anything onto anybody because nobody des desperately needs a lawyer at a networking event in that moment when you're meeting people. So Michael, did you have some thoughts as well? I did. The, the other thing that I thought was really valuable was making sure that we, we take time to practice our pitch. Because when you go to these networking events, especially the first couple of times you go to them, you don't know what to expect, right? You're a new lawyer. You're now going to these events because you want to build business, but how do you build business? And to Ursha's point, you, you have to have a, a pitch that's refined that people will gravitate towards because it is a relationship game. It's not about going in and selling your services to everybody you meet. You need to go in and build a relationship so that in you know, a month from now, when their friend is complaining about this problem they're having, they can say, oh, I met so-and-so. And to do that, you need to have a short pitch that's, you know, I believe it was 15 to 25 seconds. But the only way you get there where it's coherent and concise is that you have to practice it. And if you go, if you get into a rhythm and have a good pitch that you've practiced and doesn't sound rehearsed and that you're comfortable with, it'll go a long way. Exactly. So hopefully everybody's, you know, more comfortable with, you know, just introducing yourself. And I think you had something to add as well. Yeah, I want to talk, we also talked about the neuroscience of it, which is basically that when you meet a new person who you're not, you know, you've never met before, you're not comfortable with, you have kind of an adrenaline stress response. But then when you get, when you connect with somebody, you have like a warm, fuzzy, happy response. And you want to get from that stress response to the happy response as quickly as possible. Um, and when I thought, like, how I applied this is when I have gone to networking events in the before times, I've really enjoyed connecting with people about, like, the fact that we both have children and have to deal with that or what outdoor activities we enjoy doing together. And then as a follow up on that, I've invited people to, like, go on hikes or go bouldering and doing stuff where, like, we're both having, um, a new experience and like building connections and actually getting to know and like each other as people and it's beyond and outside of just we're both professionals which is just a small part of who we actually are that's a real that's a really good point and the idea around neuroscience for those who aren't familiar with it is that when you are comfortable with somebody and when you can have a good conversation with somebody it produces dopamine and serotonin in the brain. And those are neurochemicals that allow for connection and trust. And <clears throat> we will refer people, we will uh, send business to people, to those who we really do trust and who we like. So the, what, what Ada is getting at is like when she was found a way to connect with people in other ways, not just you know, at a networking event where we both do something professionally, it deepens those relationships and those connections and makes it easier to refer those to refer to one another. And one of the things that we did with our group, uh, the Young Leaders Group, is that everybody had a chance to have breakout sessions on Zoom and then they met on their own independently to continue to build those connections and build those relationships because relationship networking is really the long game, not, not just the short game. And, and that was the whole idea around that. Something else that we talked about uh, on this whole, thank you for starting Ada with the neuroscience stuff because I'm gonna go into the next question on neuroscience. But we talked a lot about um, building habits around business development, behaviors and habits and using the science around that to build it into our, our schedule. And, and who, who is it gonna, Sumana, are you gonna to talk to that topic? Sure, sure. I, you know, I think with respect to the neuroscience, much of what we discussed was creating a habit similar to exercise and, and business development in that sense is also we create habits, we reach out to our colleagues, our former classmates, our friends, and, and sort of stay in the loop with people and do this in a, on a consistent basis, build time into our calendar to, to work on these business development efforts 
For me, if I don't have a meeting that's scrolling on LinkedIn, that's being incredibly active on social media to the point where I'm trending, where I'm, I'm at the top of, of everyone's sort of feed, everyone knows my name. So when I do go to an event like this, both on Zoom or you know at an in-person networking event, people I can introduce myself and people say, oh, I saw your post or I remember you or you, you had uh, posted this article and sort of to get people in people's mind was, was uh, something that we discussed with the neuroscience of sort of thinking ahead and creating habits around our business uh, and networking. Yeah, and, and just how do I? Go ahead. Uh, so just to build off of that, you know, we all are super busy and it's really hard to say, oh, I'm going to spend two hours a day, you know, doing business development. Uh, it, it's really a much better approach if you can do bite-sized commitments, like a small commitment. Say, okay, I'm going to spend 10, 15 minutes every morning. That's it. That's all I can do. But do it. It's like going for you know 10-minute run every day versus planning this big two-hour run that never happens because it's really hard to carve out two hours. And you know, it's it, just the persistency and perseverance. It makes a difference. So keep doing what you're doing, it, it, it will eventually res have results, um, as, as opposed to having grandiose plans and not setting them into action, it's much worse. And sometimes it could be a quick email, sometimes it could be an article we forward, sometimes it can be just, you know, how are you doing and, and check in on people, you know, like if you represent business owners, how's their business doing, uh, where do they see problems, and before you know it, they may have a problem they didn't realize and you're asked to help. <laughs> That's it. And it is, the, it is the long game again. And one of the big mistakes that I've seen lawyers make is that they get very busy with what lawyer work and then they drop their business development and then they panic because there's no new business in the pipeline. And then they hustle like crazy to build up their networking again and start going to conferences and having coffees and then they get busy again. And, and it's like up and down and up and down. And the idea around building a habit for business development is to be consistent with it. And to that the, neuro, the neuroscience part of it is you already have habits that you've developed in your day-to-day -day life. So maybe for some of you, it's like you're having a cup of coffee in the morning. So when you're doing that coffee, can you add on something else? Like I'm going to send an email or a LinkedIn post, like Sumana was saying, so that you're building a new neural pathway around a habit that will then stick with you for the duration of your career. And you're not having to create something like, oh my God, this week I better do more business development. I haven't done enough. And so that's why building a habit around it is important. And it is also sustainable for the, for the long term. Uh, you know, as we were working on this program, it's a young leaders program and, and in roles of leadership, often things happen that are of conflict or difficult conversations have to be had. So we did a whole workshop on, you know, how do you have those difficult conversations? Like sometimes a client might call you and dispute a bill, you know, it's like, you know, this is too expensive. And I know this happens all the time all the time um, or a client doesn't agree with what you're you're doing or you have an issue with a, a counsel or a judge how do you handle conflict and difficult conversations so who wants us to touch on what they've picked up from that who wants to start with that Ada? i'll start i think this i mean it tags back into the neuroscience like if you're constantly working on building personal rapport with people including clients and folks you work with then um, when you have conflict, it's gonna be a lot easier because it's all conversation based. And we talked about a couple of different models, but one was um, the TKI model, where people have five different responses to conflict from assertive to unassertive. And I thought it was really helpful to think about like in different circumstances, I have different, like depending on circumstances, I have different reactions to conflict. And just to kind of flag that and check where I am with the conflict and based on that, like how I really want to respond. That's yeah, the, the TKI model is that Thomas Kilman conflict modes and there's five different modes that it is talking about. So you have conflict is not good or bad. It's just conflict, right? It just happens. So you can respond by sticking your head in the ground, like saying, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna avoid this situation completely, or I'm gonna assert myself and be aggressive, or I'm gonna compromise. There's different approaches that you can take and that uh, you can look at where you are and say, okay, you know what, in this instance, 
I'm just going to like compromise. I'm just going to, that's what we're going to do. So you have different ways, different tools that you can, you can use. So thank you for, for bringing up the TKI model. That's, that's good. Um, Sumana. I think in, in, a, in approaching conflict, especially in the context of sort of uh, dealing with an invoice or an issue is, for me, I found success in transparency, in letting a client know, well, you know, we're going to have XYZ fees and it's likely to escalate for these reasons. And then they say, okay, that's reasonable. And, and to sort of come up with a plan um, for fees or, or how to handle the matter um, and sort of keeping the client uh, aware and and cognizant of, of the status uh, throughout has helped me at least with, with the few matters that I've brought in so far um, to just be transparent and to sort of avoid this conflict completely because there's awareness um, of, of what the issue may be. And one other quick thing that I, was my takeaway for this particular topic was that words do matter. So when we do approach a person, we should think about what we want to say, what is the message we want to get across, and not put people on defensive because nobody performs well. And, and this goes in a context, not so much against, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the clients as, as your coworkers or people you are managing or supervising. Um, they will not do a good work and not do a good job if, if they are stressed out. So sometimes it's better to ask open-ended questions can you walk me through this process? How did you get to this result? As opposed to say, I think this is wrong, just do it again. <laughs> so, you know, choose words wisely, approach people with open-ended questions where they can explain before you tear it apart and tell them to do it over. <laughs> yeah, that is especially true, I think, when you're working with like associates or you are the associate who is being worked with and, uh, and somebody says, you know, this is wrong that causes an emotional reaction in somebody to get very defensive and it shuts them down. It's a, the neurochemical that comes up, comes up is this uh, cortisol and adrenaline. And when we have that pulsing through our body, when somebody says, you did this wrong, you get that hit and you, you shut down, you go into fight, flight, freeze, or appease. So understanding that the words you use will either shut people down completely or open them up and let them communicate and think better and respond to you better will make a big difference. Especially, I think especially internally when you're working within your firms and when you're working you know, with, with clients, like you, you can get so frustrated sometimes you have to know when to take a, take a, take a breath, take a beat on, on conflict for sure. And the other thoughts around conflict or did we, we cover it all? Okay. Okay, did anybody want to talk at all to the three levels of conversation? Do you remember that model where we talked about, you know, building trust, how to build trust on that neuroscience scale? I'm throwing a curveball here. Uh, we talked about the three levels of conversation and building up to the neuroscience. And the first level is that when you're having a very transactional relationship and you don't really have to know the person that well, you can just go back and forth with them. The second level is, you know, I kind of trust you, but I'm not 100% sure we all get along right, so I'm going to trust but verify. And then when we get into the third level, we have a lot of trust so that a client, if they're in the third level and have deep trust with you, can challenge you and you're not scared that they're going to like leave you for another firm or not listen to the advice that you're or the counsel that you're giving. So understanding the three levels of conversation also play in to this model of conflict. So let's talk a little bit, let's, let's swing back into um, another area which we covered. And I'm just like on the call in the chat box, if anybody's available, how many of you are dealing with time pressure or stress? And if you wanna say something in the chat box, you can say yes or no, time pressure or stress. And we talked a lot, we did a whole um, two and a half hour workshop on managing time, stress, and energy. And because lawyers are dealing with that all the time. So who wants to talk to that, uh, what, what you learned and what some of the key takeaways were for that? Um, I, I have a couple of main, you know, two takeaways. Again, this could be a standalone course on its own, how to manage time and stress for lawyers. <laughs> uh, we only had one session, but it was very helpful. Um, Two, two approaches that you know, I, I take away from Stephanie's class or, or, or course is one is called a, a method called brain dump. So when you're focused on one big 
project, let's say you're writing a 50 page agreement or a memorandum or whatever you have, and you come up with some thoughts, like something comes up, oh, I have to make that call. I have to delegate that other project, or I have a great business development idea. Don't let that distract you because you will lose the focus on the big task you're at. So just have some kind of a notepad or an app or you know calendar, wherever you wanna put your reminders, write it down and move back to the original task, to the big task, and then come back when you're done with that, come back to all these reminders you have. And you know, the interesting part about it is that great ideas don't always come up when you're in the office and you have a desk and your notepad there. Sometimes they come up when you're on a train or you're in a car or you're in a shower. So keep that notepad everywhere you go and wherever you have the, your best ideas so that A, you can brain dump and not be distracted, and B, you don't forget some great ideas. Um, the the key, key point here is that you keep that in one spot because if you have a ton of post-its, you will never do anything well and you will never remember things. So keep it organized in one spot and that will help you clear the focus so you can stay on task and then also remind you later to pick up that, that other idea. So that's one idea. Um, and then the other one was about the stress management. Um, and it was about managing the major distractions. And I'm sure everybody can relate to that right now because we're all working from home, juggling personal and, and professional stuff. It's, it's even harder to focus. And there's so many distractions from, you know, dogs barking, kids crying, uh, people calling you, it's people stepping in into the Zoom calls, <laughs> crashing when you don't expect. So all those things, how do you manage those, you know, how do you manage those distractions? Well, there's two major steps. One is first identify what are your distractions because each person will have different things. Maybe it's your calls. People are constantly calling you. Uh, maybe it's the emails you're checking or the email reminders that are popping up. Turn them off. Uh, maybe it's internet that you you know you're, you're browsing while you're on a call with 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 clients or, you know or or something else. Those are all distractions and multitasking is not very effective. At the end of the day, you don't do either of the tasks well. So just stay on on one of them and do the other one later. But figure out what your distractions are. And then the second part is figure out how to address them, how to ignore them. If you know the phone calls are the ones that interrupt your big project, maybe you put your phone on silent for an hour or two so you can finish, or you turn off your e email reminders and pop-ups, or whatever you, know, whatever you can do, get your noise canceling headsets, uh, you know, close the door, put a post-it on it, do not disturb, whatever is your major distraction, try to address it, and then try to package your projects together so that you have time for each of those things, so that you have time for your personal stuff, you stuff, you know, time for your professional stuff, for business development, for certain different type of projects, try to bundle those up so that you don't get constantly distracted. And, you know, think about it. It's not necessary to pick up every phone call. If it's not related to the thing you're doing, you can call a person back in 20 minutes when you're done with that email. Otherwise, you, there's a lot of time that goes wasted when you're juggling multiple things and go back and forth. Um, Stephanie will tell you how many minutes exactly you lose with each interaction. I forgot the exact number, but it's a lot. <laughs> Is it four minutes? Oh, no, it's way more than that. Oh, way more, okay. <laughs> 25, yeah. Yeah, exactly, 25. Okay. Yeah, and I wanted to build on that. I mean, I thought it was really, I think that we're all thinking a lot about boundaries right now because we're, a lot of us are working from home and have kids and dogs. Um, but one thing that we learned about, which I loved, was how you, you need to have um, 30 to 90 minutes of gray time every day where you're thinking strategically about what you're accomplishing that day and like how it's fitting in with your short and long-term goals. And uh, permitting myself that, like having that personal boundary around like you get time to kind of just wrap your head around everything has enabled me to become more, um, of proactive and not just responsive as stuff comes in and also like building in time because you know projects are going to come in during the day but you also know that you have to do a significant you know certain chunks of work during the day and being more diligent about like okay I have these times where I'm actually going to work where I'm going to turn off my phone and not feel guilty about it um, 
And then I'm also going to have time where I like get back on my email and I'm responsive and I'm kind of responding to the things that come in during the day. So that, that was a nice, like set that boundary every day of just 30 minutes. You know, I mean, for me, it's like I do the dishes or I tidy up around the house or I do some yoga. And I think about like, who am I showing up as at work today? And how is that furthering my goal? Love that idea. I never thought doing the dishes would be so productive, but that's good. <laughs> that's really, that's true. Yeah, we, 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 if we, if we don't block out time to think strategically, we end up putting out fires nonstop and we don't, we don't ever get that time back. So it's really about being very deliberate about carving time out to say, hey, what do I want to accomplish? What is my intention for this day to achieve? Michael, how about for you? I think there's, we live in a time now where you're always accessible, whether you're on vacation, whether you're at home, whether you're in the office, no matter what you're doing now with the way technology is, people can get to you and you can work from anywhere. So for me, one of the things that I am horrible at, and my wife and my children will tell every one of you this as well, is that I don't stop. I'll be sitting on the couch watching TV at night and I'll be answering emails. I'll be doing stuff on my iPad for work. I just don't stop. And for me, one of the biggest personal takeaways from this is that I need to stop. Um, and one of the point that resonated so well with me was in our one session, Stephanie noted that, you know, if I'm in a client meeting with a client one-on-one, you know, am I sitting there checking my phone? Am I responding to emails? And I'm not because I want to give them that attention, you know, that they deserve. And I don't do that at home. And I think for me, you know, a stress reliever and a time management thing is to just put your phone away. And I think we all would do better to a certain point if we just shut down for a little bit, uh, whether it's the great time or, or just to get away from everything. And for me, you know, not checking my email and not responding to phone calls right away and getting to a certain point in the night where I just say, Hey, I'm done. Um, you know, I, that's been a major improvement for me because, you know, my family tolerates me. Well, if you got anything out of this program, the fact that your family tolerates you is a good thing, right? <laughs> but it's, you know, it's so true. There's so many things that are, especially now because of COVID, interrupting our concentration and taking time away from what we need to do. And, you know, especially like as attorneys, you're paid for your, your thoughts. You're paid to think strategically. You're paid for all of that time. So when your head is cluttered with so many other things and there's always distractions and you don't take breaks, you can burn out and you can also not get very creative very quickly. It could just go downhill very, very fast. Not only that, but with the 25 minutes of lost time for distractions, that adds up uh, in billable time, everybody. And you could lose like thousands of dollars a week. I have clients that actually make more money when they manage their time better they can double and triple their weekly goals. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So distractions and awareness and great time, this are all really, really good things. Sumana, did you have one as well? I do. I, I, I came across something during my LinkedIn scrolling, and it's been very helpful for me in my practice. It's to spend time every day to look at our calendar for the next seven days, and, on, and every Friday to look at our calendar for the next 30 days. And in doing that, there's less surprises, and so hopefully less fires. Um, and then we're sort of more efficient, and I feel like I have better control over my life, my practice, my work, because I know what's coming. And so I've, I've found this tool very very helpful in my daily practice and it's it's one minute of gray time a day right to just look at our calendar see see what we have going on for the next week and then see what we have going on for the month we can sort of plan accordingly so I think that's that's been very helpful for me for for stress management I also want to jump in and say you I think it was in this session that you taught us that like any email you send after 8 p.m. is not going to be forwarding the cause um, and so I've stopped, I've turned off notifications, unless I'm working past 8 p.m., which happens. Um, I've turned off notifications and then like totally shut my phone down usually after 10 p.m., kind of put it, you know, put a cover over its birdcage. And that's been really nice. It's, it's given me like at least a couple hours every night where I'm totally, I don't have to think about work. Um, and that's been a really good mental break. Also, I've started at the end of every day, I will send myself an email with my to-do list for the next day, which is like part of a longer document, but that's 
closing out the day like that enables me to not keep looking at my calendar and be like, oh God, do I have meetings tomorrow? Like what's going on? So. Great, great points. Uh, great points, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. If anybody has any questions or has any other tips that they are using, I invite you to drop them into the chat box so we can, we can take, a, take a look at them. Because as you can see by the animated conversation that we're having around time management, and we're not even covering everything we discussed, there's a lot to be said about you know, the stress and the distractions and the focus and all of that that, that goes into our day, and especially as, like as attorneys. And especially as attorneys who many of us are working from home with you know, the Amazon delivery, um, I think Ursha was saying, like, keeping that book next to you, a notebook, keeping it handy. I was watching an interview with Lynn manuel Miranda, who wrote Hamilton, and he wrote the whole play practically, or most of it, on the train. Right, Meg? I see Meg, Meg's not, like, he, he, he wrote it on the train. That was when he did his best writing. He was, we, we have our best thoughts usually when we're not at our desk and we're, when we're not looking at our email. So it's just a, something else to, to think about. So that was another topic that we covered in great length in, in the workshops. And the other one that we'll talk about next is the whole concept of finding a niche. The example that I used to the group was um, when I first moved to the United States, I went to buy tomato sauce and I was looking at the tomato sauce aisle and there were it went on forever I, I i couldn't figure out which tomato sauce to buy because there was tomato basil and tomato not basil and spicy tomato and roasted tomato like there was a good million different variations of tomato sauce and i had moved here from canada where in canada we only had a few choices i mean maybe a half an aisle not the whole aisle top to bottom and so the category is tomato sauce but then you have niches in those sauces which is, you know, spicy, not spicy, roasted, not roasted. And so I kind of likened it and compared it very loosely to law. When we say we're a lawyer and we can do everything, it's very hard for others to be able to say, oh yeah, I can definitely refer, you know, refer you, Michael, because you do everything. But if Michael has something specific that he does in his practice, that will stick with me and I can then refer something over to him. So Actually, Michael has a really cool niche. You want to share it, Michael? Yes, that's a good segue. So I, as Stephanie noted in my introduction, I have a transactional practice that includes banking and real estate and all the other stuff that every transactional attorney says they do. But what I have developed with a couple of my colleagues in my firm is that we have a niche where we sell, you know, we help municipalities and municipal authorities sell their sewage and or water systems. So if a municipal government in Pennsylvania wants to sell their pipes that transport, you know, sewage from your house to the local treatment plant, they call our firm. And we're one of only a handful of firms in the whole state of Pennsylvania that does that. So it's good because for me, finding my niche, it's, it's an area that involves all other transactional practice. It involves finance and it involves real estate and involves everything else you could have in a transactional practice. But people... A lot of people just don't do sewage for a number of different reasons. And, you know, one of the, one of the things we talked about with to grow in your niche is to find something you like, find something you're interested in and to look at the competition and you need to figure out who your ideal client is and how to get there. And for me, as I continue to build my practice, a large por portion of my practice is trying to develop that niche because the competition is not there. And it's something that's unique that people, it, it's a newer thing where we're, where we're from. There was a law that was changed a few years ago that really accelerated the, the, the ability to sell water and sewer systems. And now there's not many people that do it. So we're trying to get it on the ground up and I'm trying to continue to grow my niche to learn as much about it and research mu as much about it as possible because, you know, part of the process is finding something you like and finding something you want to practice in, but you also have to know what you're talking about and having a niche you don't want to spend time on learning about just doesn't work so you know if there's something out there you like i would encourage you to go for it especially if it's tangentially related to your current practice area because you never know what's going to come of it it's so true and there's so many lawyers that have you and having a niche doesn't mean you can't have multiple niches but depending on the networking event that you're going to or the people that you're talking to you can um like hone it a little bit 
for that network that you're that you're in. Uh, any other examples of this before we, we move on to the the next topic? Well, yeah, Sumana. So I just wanted to note, while I agree completely about finding our niche for our practice, for me in my own life, I found that I'm trying to be the person that knows somebody. And so while I don't, my niche is that I know everybody, I have a referral for you, I can help you and be sort of a problem solver. Um, and, you know, I come from a community where there are not many attorneys. And so people come to me with all kinds of questions that I don't know the answer to, but I can I know how to process information. And so I can start looking into it. I can find a referral. I can see that through till the end. Did you find somebody? Did you sign up with somebody? Are, are you satisfied? And then, and to be that sort of go-to person. And that's how I'm trying to sort of develop my practice and my life to just, to be a resource for, for everyone around me. And that really, um, that really feeds into the whole idea that we talked about, which was, you know, building your network because a network that you, is a community that you have around you that you can, yeah, you can help your network or the network can help you. And that's why it's so important to build relationships and connections within your, your networks. Does anybody have any examples? And I don't know if I asked this before, of like, like Sumana was saying of helping others using your, using their network or even with that, within ally law, being able to share any ideas within ally law. Yeah. I'm looking forward to building it within ally law. Um, but I have, I came from a firm where, well, where a lot of other folks had left. And so now I have this kind of informal network and we refer things to each other all the time. And we're all um, female and diverse in some way. So queer or BIPOC or something else. And we've also started like a monthly lunch group where we just get together and strategize and kind of form a brain trust of, you know, we're encountering this issue with a partner or we're or with a client or whatever, and we can kind of bring it into that safe space to discuss. And it delights me to be able to like have that referral network and know that I can rely on those people. And that's, and that's really important. And thank you for sharing that because having your network and having a community is important. And you teed me up for a really good segue. So thank you. Uh, I wanted to segue into Ally Law because every, nobody in this program I shouldn't say nobody. Most of you didn't know each other before you came into this program. And probably many of you didn't know much about Ally Law before you came into this program because as I was kind of told, many of you had you have delegates in your firms that yet get to go to the meeting. So you don't all get to participate in different Ally Law events. So let's just like kind of switch gears and talk about like what was your thought about what this program was and what Ally Law was before you you came in? Yeah, I, I can start. I, you know, first of all, I have to say thank you. I was very honored to be part of this first generation of Ally Law Young Leaders Development Program. I know it was a pilot program and it was fantastic. Um, I had a slight idea about Ally Law before. I met Meg uh, before because she's in Chicago um, and we had some of the leaders in Chicago a year and a half ago before COVID. <laughs> so I was invited to, to lunch with them, although I'm not one of the senior attorneys who is our representative for Ally Law, but I have a very diverse and international background. And you know, I, I moved from Europe to the States 17 years ago and I acted as an international law firm doing cross-border deals for five years before I joined much. Uh, while my practice is now mostly US-based, I still have that affinity for international things and I oftentimes help European companies when they come to the States and they need some help here locally, so inbound business. And you know, ultimately our clients, even if they're mid-sized companies, which our clients predominantly are, they have some international components. The world is becoming a global village. If nothing else, they buy or sell products cross border, or they have some internet services that are, you know, either they're buying them or selling them. So there we had, I would say, I worked personally on three different transactions in the last five years where we involved other Ally Law members. Um, and one was pretty funny. I was asked to review a contract and uh, for you know another partner and I said, sure, I'll review it. I get to the end of it and it says it's governed by the British Columbia laws, Canada. I'm like, why am I reviewing this? I, I can't give you an opinion on that. Um, so you know, and the other time was when we ha had a client, a Midwestern company, 
but somehow they ended up having a subsidiary in China and, the, and the, in, in Hong Kong. So the, when I saw that deal, I told, you know, I immediately talked to the senior partner leading it. We, we need local counsel. We can't possibly do this ourselves, knowing how complicated China is, especially. Well, and the funny part is that through our program, I connected with an attorney in Hong Kong who happens to be on our call. If she wants to introduce herself, I'm not going to call her out. But it was really interesting to say, you know, hey, next time I have a deal in Hong Kong, I'm calling you directly. I'm not asking senior partner who they recommend. And, you know, th this was really important that we in our younger generation develop context with each other. So it was not just learning certain skills that Stephanie, you know, gave us tools to work on. It was actually putting those skills in, in, in practice right off, you know, off the bat, like connecting with each other, networking, and having that network across the, you know, across the globe and, and in the U.S. So it was fantastic. I, I love that I'm all for this international connection. So <laughs> if you're ever in Chicago or if I ever travel, I'll definitely reach out. <laughs> yeah. Um... I would also want to say that I really enjoyed this program and it was great to talk to Usha and also I have chances to talk to Samana and Ada on a one-on-one -on -one discussion. So yeah, I think it's a great way to network. Um, and through this program, like, I also learned a lot from Stephanie. So um, yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, a lot of that. Yeah, Ada. Um, no, it was amazing. I mean, I reached out this week on a deal where we had a Missouri law question. We reached out to our ally law counterpart and got it answered in like an afternoon. And it was so nice being able to A, do this like development training that was in this really fast paced, but also like useful format and also make connections with people who I'm going to be reaching out to for like errant quick questions. For, and hopefully collaborating with. Sumana, did you have a story? And then Ada, I want you to tell the story of the judge after. I, I do, yeah. So I, I connected with uh, um, with Mithri in in London, um, and we, you know when we were talking our sort of one on one, we found that both of our families are from the same ancestral village in India. We probably spent summers at the same place at the same time, um, and knew some of the same locations and and tourist spots. So it was immediately a, a personal connection. She's now somebody I feel that you know we're connected online, and and somebody I feel I could call when I'm in London and and to meet, um, discuss work and. And, and chat personally as well. And so I just think that this this program has given us an opportunity to network in a group that I of people that I wouldn't have otherwise met. And so not only are the connections incredibly useful since we're all willing to sort of help each other, bounce ideas off each other, but it's also just a group of people that ne that now I know that that I wouldn't have there's no way I would have otherwise known. And so I think it's just been a, a fantastic opportunity, especially in the time of COVID to to do this virtually and still develop relationships. Yeah, so, so my story is when I was a kid, we had this neighbor and our neighbor was a PhD student at the University of Washington. And he had a brother who would come and be a visiting professor at the law school. And this guy, they're, they're from Buenos Aires in Argentina. And so this guy would just be over like smoking cigarettes in the backyard. We would go on hikes together, like our families. And when I was talking to Pilar, who was in our LA law training, um, who's in Buenos Aires and she's an administrative attorney and I was talking asking her what she did and I was like oh do you know this guy who's a judge and you know he's he was our old neighbor's brother and like I tried to take him on a hike when I was a kid but he was wearing loafers and he was in a terrible mood about it and he wouldn't stop smoking and she was like oh yeah I appear before him all the time like he's incredibly intimidating and I was like he is <laughs> so we connected over that and we've been chatting like every month. So that's really nice. I love it. I love it. Mike, Michael, how about for you? I, uh, so I, I, like my colleagues on the panel, I knew Ally Law because when we had a, you know, outside Pennsylvania, New Jersey jurisdiction, somebody would say, oh, we'll, we'll reach out to somebody in Ally Law and we'll get local counsel. For me, when I was asked to do this program, I was excited to be part of the Young Leaders program. But I, as I, I told Stephanie in our one-on-one -on -one session, I was skeptical because, you know, you get asked to do these programs and you never know what you're going to get. But 
I would recommend it to anybody that's interested in either meeting new people or just learning how to better develop yourself as an attorney and a person. I mean, some of this, not only did I get to meet 23 people who I would never have crossed paths on what, from all over the world, but I learned stuff in here that I take with me, whether it's, you know, taking time every day to do business development, whether it's putting my phone down at night and, you know, just, just stuff that it's good to hear a third, you know, an outside person's perspective. And Stephanie was great. In addition to the, you know, the classes we had, we had an opportunity to do one-on-one -on -one sessions that, you know, I think really helped me grow as a professional and even as a person. So I, you know, I appreciate the program and I, I recommend it to everybody that, you know, is here listening to the panel if, if it's offered next year. That's great. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was going to add to that plug, you know, it's fantastic program. So it shouldn't stay just a pilot. Keep keep doing it. I hope that uh, everybody at Ally Law hears that. Uh, but also, it's very important for all the younger attorneys to realize, that, you know, maybe this pandemic is an opportunity uh, because typically Ally Law does their conference in the fall and all, every, every firm only sends two senior representatives. So this is the opportunity for us to connect virtually but still, otherwise you wouldn't even go to these conferences because they wouldn't be held virtually. So, you know, take, take the advantage of these free sessions that are available this week and next week. Um, if you didn't make it to some of them, they will be recorded. Um, and then reach out to people and say, hey, you know, I, I saw you speak on that panel. I was really interested in what you had to say. Hey, would you have a chat with me for 10 minutes on Zoom? You know, everybody loves that. <laughs> Who doesn't love a fan, right? So uh, don't feel, you know, you can't reach out to people and, and do take part in these programs because they are doing exactly what you're doing, except in a different jurisdiction. So it, it, we all share that experience and we are all helping each other um, when we have clients who need help in another jurisdiction. Uh, I'll, I'll echo uh, Ursha's comment too. Like if you, if you have a question about a specific part of the program, don't hesitate to reach out to, to anybody that was in it because I think everybody feels the same way about it, whether they're, all, they're on the panel today or the earlier panel or aren't on a panel at all. I mean, I think everybody enjoyed and appreciated the program and they'd be happy to provide some sort of, you know, guidance and answers about whether, you know, it's right for you and, you know, including myself. So don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things that I think is really great about what's going on now in terms of what you can do for those people that are participating on, on listening to the call and it's come through so strongly is that there's a real camaraderie between the people that were in the program that there's these friendships that have uh, come up of it like i think ada is going to be going to have a visitor from italy at some point to go skiing and there's these connections and i think we had a uh, Two guest, two guest speakers that came in, actually four guest speakers that came in to talk about Ally Law and what it meant for them. And it's the long game, right? It's relationships and it's having people to talk to and to know who can support you, not just, um, not just for the legal side and for the networking side, but you know, if you're frustrated about something, these are non-competing lawyers that you have a connection with that can, you can help each other out and give each other some um, some guidance and then know that you can talk to these people without being judged necessarily. And then hopefully one day we all get to meet in person and you can have even more fun because they'll already have a foundation. You'll already, already know each other. So for those of you who are on the call that, you know, are not part of the program and maybe you are some of the younger lawyers that don't get to go to those big meetings, get into the habit and the behavior of picking up the phone or getting on a Zoom and introducing yourself to anybody that you've met on this panel today and start building out your network within Ally Law as well, because it's that easy. And we learned that, I think, from, from having Zoom um, as part of our, you know, as part of our training and part of our super conference right now. So on that note, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap, wrap things up with a, like with a little bow. <laughs> we covered a lot uh, tonight and that wasn't just, that wasn't, everything that we did we talked about you know finding your niche and um, how to have a conversation at a networking event without having to feel like a sleazy salesy salesperson um, when we're going to networking events we're not you know handing out business cards you know like here you go like, like like a deck of cards you're really going to meet people and to connect and to network and in times like this during COVID, it might 
feel harder for you, but it's as simple as reaching out to the network that's already here and already established for you, which is Ally Law. That's a total um, great thing about having a network like Ally Law. You, it's, warm, it's a warm referral. It's warm. It's not, you know, you're not cold calling anybody. You can start building your own habits and your own practice around that. And then, you know, what is it that you do? Can you really be clear about what, what you do and what area you like to do it in? Like Allison was in our program and Allison does family law. And it's like, well, where do I do our family law? How, how do I say that? How do I say that comfortably and just getting into a habit of introducing yourself in a way that feels very, very comfortable for you? So those are the things that we covered and then time management and stress management. For anybody that wants more uh, information on that, speak to the panelists here tonight, but I'm sure they'll be happy to share. I would love to thank all of the panelists for your contributions tonight. You were amazing. Um, any final thoughts before we, we wrap things up? We'll miss you all. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Stephanie. That was thank awesome. you. Meg, do you want to? You want to, uh, I want to say we have two more days of programming. Please register. And I'm pleased to say that in 2021, we are going to be continuing the Young Leaders Development Program. Um, so for anyone who's interested, please do let us know. We are going to continue. And um, Ursha, when you said we'll miss you all, we're going to make plans to keep that in the inaugural group connected. And we're working on planning a virtual happy hour in December for the group. So look awesome. forward to that. Excellent. Thanks everyone for um, coming tonight and thank you to Stephanie and our panelists. Take care, stay safe. Thanks thank you again. Bye everyone. Thanks Bye. everyone. Yeah.